All right, let's not tiptoe like we know each other because we most likely don't. I'm Dr. Skipper and you definitely know about the iceberg trend. And while I could lie through my teeth and how I solely wanted to make this video to discuss information to me enjoying the idea of talking about information with me being the main source of attention. Wait, on second thought? I did want to make this video. Aren't we all learning things today? But to the small fraction of those who were subscribed before this video, I recommend you clean your room, take a walk, or even go to sleep to the crisp sound of my audio. Wow, Skipper. Pretentious much? Absolutely. But yeah, for real, this video is more of just me talking than trying to crack jokes with attention span editing. But I'd rather break my kneecaps than be a stale wet towel so I'll just attempt to not sound like a complete robot. But an iceberg is a tier list discussing the most common things to the least common things. And the iceberg I'll be discussing today is the Nickelodeon iceberg that I found on Reddit by Semidus? Hope I pronounced that right. Yes, I checked Reddit. Someone took Family Guy and it seems interesting. Leave me alone. Since I'm not 45, Amish or boring, I grew up like most of you watching Nickelodeon. I wouldn't be the person I am today if it wasn't for the 7 a.m. Saturday mornings where I would just sit there with my Captain Crunch and watch SpongeBob. If you think I'm talking about myself as a child, we'll add another naughty star to my name because you'll be disappointed. I'm a grown ass man still making sea bear circles fucking sue me. But yeah, I chose the Nickelodeon iceberg, so let's start with the first layer. Are you ready, kids? I can continue this gag, but most of you probably don't give a shit, so. I'll just move on. Butch Hartman. Butch Hartman is an American animator, writer, producer, YouTuber, director, author, and voice actor. Best known for creating Nickelodeon's The Fairly Odd Parents, Danny Phantom, Tough Puppy, and Bunsen is a Beast. Hartman also owns a production company, Billion Fold Incorporated, which he uses primarily to produce his shows. Hartman was an executive producer of The Fairly Odd Parents for the entirety of its 16 year run. On February 8, 2018, Hartman announced in a YouTube video that he had left Nickelodeon on February 2nd. After having worked with the studio since December 1997, he confirmed that it's resulted in the end of the production of Bunsen is a Beast after just one season. Hartman's latest animated program, Hobby Kids Adventures, premiered on YouTube in 2019. Aside from the lawyer talk, I assume he's on the iceberg due to some of his controversies. Hartman has been involved in several incidents which caused backlash, including being accused of minimalizing mental health issues while blaming technology. He was also criticized through claiming through his nonprofit organization that religion could cure alignments such as bipolar disorder, autism, heart disease, kidney failure. Additionally, Hartman misled backers on Kickstarter regarding both the religious nature and activities of his streaming platform startup. After the fundraising goal had been reached, on July 25th, 2018, he specified that although his faith will continue on his part of his life, his streaming platform will not be faith-based. While I usually tend to catch Cosmo and Wanda slipping, I could agree this guy's a fucking nut job. Or maybe he's just a fucking genius and unlock the third eye. If you're autistic and don't want to be anymore, this guy cracked the fucking code, just pray it away. When I first started this iceberg, I was dealing with paralysis and couldn't even get to the bathroom on my own, and you changed my life. Here's the middle. Astrology with Squidward. Astrology with Squidward is a series of SpongeBob SquarePants shorts that originally aired from 2000 to 2001. They feature Squidward giving horoscopes for six of the 12 zodiac signs. In July 2019, Nickelodeon India released a second series of the zodiac themed shorts titled Undersea Horoscopes. All 12 of the signs are covered, unlike in Astrology with Squidward. At the beginning of every short, Squidward plays a clarinet, and then after that, he congratulates the birthday of one of the zodiac signs and then starts predicting the end of every short. Squidward says, I'm Squidward, your Nicktoon Astrology. Astrologer. Then he says something random, then he plays his clarinet again. Squidward's astrology segments during Spongebob's Nicktoon Summer Splash are set in Spongebob's house. They feature identical animation to Squidward for his clarinet. As part of his summer hosting duty, Spongebob comments on Squidward's predictions, much to later his annoyance. On February 2nd, 2020, every short was put on a compilation then uploaded to the Spongebob Squarepants YouTube channel. You could probably watch it there. To be completely honest, I had no clue this was a thing until making this video. But I'm a Gemini, so if you're a Gemini as well, well... Holler at me in the comments. And if you're anything else, well, you know, fuck it. Just leave a comment down there as well. Crash Nebula spinoff. Crash Nebula is the 21st episode of season five of Fairly Odd Parents. It aired on July 2nd, 2004, but it's considered a part of season five in production, and this episode was technically a backdoor pilot of the show. Our man Butch attempted to create Crash Nebula as a spinoff animated series. After a long while of speculation, Butch Hartman continued on January 24th, 2006. The whole project was called off and the series was not going to be made. He does though intend to keep trying and the concept may come back someday. The concept was also written as a movie script and pitched to Paramount Pictures as the feature film. It would have been titled Crash Nebula the movie, however it was rejected, as there is way too many similarities to Sky High, a movie that was already being put out by Walt Disney. Due to the cancellation of Danny Phantom, and as well as the debut of Tough Puppy, the idea has likely been scrapped by Billion Fold Studios. Even though the dude's a complete nut job, still gotta give him props. He's taking a lot of L's, but Sky High was my fucking shit and it would've been hard to top that. Adventure Time Pilot. 
Adventure Time first aired as a part of Nickelodeon's network's random cartoon series showcased on December 7, 2008. Leading to the creation of the animated series, it was nominated for an Annie Award for Best Animated Sort Subject. The short and the series share elements, but the two are slightly different in setting, especially in regards to the post-apocalyptic setting, which only featured in the television series. Damn, Nickelodeon, you're down bad? Could have had Adventure Time? Psh. Bacon pancakes, bitch. Red Mist. Red Mist Squidward is a reference to the popular online horror story based on SpongeBob titled Red Mist. The story was made in 2010 and was accompanied by edited image of Squidward with red misty eyes. Red Misty Squidward was drawn into the storyboard by Adam Pullion, who originally wanted the face to get closer and closer until Squidward slammed the door shut. Vincent Waller said that the show's crew wanted to make a reference to truly silly trying to be dark fan fiction. Ego Plum, a composer who joined the SpongeBob crew in 2019, created an original music track for Red Mist Squidward's appearance. It is titled Red Miss Q, in a direct reference to the 2010 story. The original track is 15 seconds long, but only about 4 seconds could be heard clearly in the finished episode. Waller clarified that the original plot of Red Mist is not canonical to Red Miss Squidward as a character in the official series. In a response to the question about the story being canon, he said, No, not at all. But we could certainly make fun of it in all of its mythic stupidity. He later said, No. Other than us poking fun, the ridiculous fanfiction is far from canon. In the UK and future United States airing, starting November 2019, an international digital version of Spongebob and Random Line, the scene featuring Red Miss Squidward was cut due to standards and practice issues, with the clip being replaced with a short animation of Baby Squidward. However, the original version of the scene remains on the Nick App version of the episode, and as of December 2019, Canadian airings on YTV. In response to censorship, Polian stated, it's actually kind of funny that it got censored. Nick's series final episodes in Netflix. I have no fucking clue if there's something deep. I mean, sure. Maybe some series finale episodes are on Netflix. <laughs> Victorious, iCarly, H Henry Danger, they're all on Netflix. I don't fucking know. Maybe one of the finales has like something that could fucking solve world hunger. But who cares? Butch already has all the answers. All right, that was the first layer of the iceberg. So from there on, Let's go to the second one. Nick Tropolis. Nick Tropolis was an MMORPG made for the Nickelodeon website in January 30th, 2007. It was created to have the world for kids with safe chat features. In 2010, it was completely rebranded to The Club, which used a few different assets, but the idea was the same. In 2013, the club was closed with a few assets remaining. And in 2016, all remaining assets carried over when Nickelodeon removed the option to join as a new user on the website. Nick Tropolis was a social MMO where you could create an avatar and customize it. You could also chat with other players, create your own room, and play games. The game would allow you to walk around various Nickelodeon themed environments, where you would play mini games or whatever intellectual property you would want to do at the time. By doing so, you'd obtain Nick points, the in-game currency. With it, you could buy items for your avatar. In 2007, I was teabagging and dropping kids on Halo 3 like it was nobody's fucking business. So this was pretty interesting to read about. Clockman. It's weird because I remember hearing about this shit as a kid. There's a chance you've seen this 2012 image floating around the internet. The viral Microsoft Paint drawing depicts a figure, the Clockman, emerging from the wall of a clock on a sleeping child's bedroom. Originating on The Flood, a Halo General discussion forum, the author of the image, Commander Santa, captioned his comic, Please help me, this cartoon has scared me for 28 years. He accompanied the image with the following description. This short animation was terrifying as a child. The scene is still burned into my mind, 28 years later. It's of a young boy sleeping in his bed. Above his bed is a ticking clock. All the lights in the room are off and it's very dark. Suddenly the clock begins to slow down, it's ticking, and it eventually stops. On midnight. When the clock stops, a greenish bluish man climbs out of the clock. The boy wakes up just in time to see this man dressed in black grab him out and kidnap him by carrying him through the window. The clock man takes the boy on some kind of terrifying adventure and brings him back before sunrise. Knowing that he had watched the animation nearly three decades prior on the then Nickelodeon pinwheel, Commander Santa called for the power of the internet to help him uncover the segment that haunted his childhood. The internet had a mystery on its hands, but not everybody bought the legitimacy of the author's claims. With no sound proof, that animation could have just never existed. Many were quick to allude Clockman to a creepypasta, despite Commander Santa's positive reputation on the flood. The treasure hunters had work cut out for them, as the majority of all pinwheel programming wasn't preserved, resulting in little no archives to search through. The network would import its content from all over the world, meaning that Clockman didn't have a definitive point of origin. But given all the time and power and numbers, it was bound to be discovered. Five years and thousands of hours of collaborative research later, the lost media was found. You can watch the video below, I'll link in the description. It was a Czech movie that was made in 1976, directed by Dagmar Dukava. I think I said that wrong. This is certainly the animation that's been hidden from the general public for 30 years. Johnny Quasar. Johnny Quasar is a precursor for Jimmy Neutron, made in 1994. Creator John A. Davis brainstormed the character Jimmy Neutron, then named Johnny Quasar. He wrote the pilot under Runaway Rocket Boy. He revisited the idea in the 90s while moving out of his home. He then pitched the idea to Siggraph, and then at Siggraph he met Steve O'Durk. 
The only known footage of this pilot to this day is a short clip where Johnny Kazar introduces himself in Goddard on DNA Productions' website, as well as with other screenshots. But then in 1999, DNA Productions changed it to Jimmy Neutron, Boy Genius. Avatar Book 4 The creators had a plan for four books in the show, but for budget reasons, they settled with three. But then they ended up expanding stuff with other media. Avatar is still one of my favorite shows, and I wouldn't want it to change much, but there's really nothing much to talk about Book 4. It was something that was going to happen, and it didn't. <laughs> I guess I'll just move on to the next one. Drake and Josh reality show theory. This is just simply a theory about how Drake and Josh is a reality show. This would explain why Drake and Josh open each episode by addressing the audience. As if they are doing a monologue, this has to mean that they realize they're on TV. YouTube personality John Solo said this in his video regarding the theory. Not to mention that Carly watched Drake and Josh in one episode and the kids on Victorious referred to it as a TV. I'm interested if you believe in this theory. Tell me down below in the comments. Bye Bye Beavers. A Tale of Two Rangers, Bye Bye Beavers, were episodes of the Angry Beavers that were produced sometime in 2001 and was intended to be the show's finale, airing in November of the same time of that year. While not much is known about the first segment, the second segment caused much controversy among Nickelodeon staff, which led to the entire episode being unaired. Nickelodeon was far from pleased with the episode, named due to the criticism of reruns, and the fact that it broke a Nickelodeon rule, which stated that no final episode of a show is allowed to allude to the fact that the show is ending. As much, neither segment from the episode was to ever broadcast, although there are rumors that it aired in Australia and Europe. Rugrats Theory I'm surprised this isn't at the top of the iceberg due to how mainstream it is. Like when I was a kid, I remember my sister thinking she cracked the third eye by telling me about this. The theory is that the Rugrats were a part of Angelica's imagination. Chucky died in 1986 along with his mother. This is why Chaz is a nervous wreck all the time. Tommy was born in 1988, but he was still born. That's why Stu is constantly in the basement making toys for the son who never had a chance to live. The DeVilles had an abortion in 1990. Angelica couldn't figure whether it would be a boy or a girl, thus creating the twins. As for all the grown-ups, the teenage Angelica became addicted to various narcotics which further aggravated her schizophrenia, bringing her back to her childhood thus for creations she obsessed over. Because of the time lapse between the present and the last time she interacted with her creations, she made them older. Angelica was just constantly taking hits of acid so she just never had to live without her creations, who were her only company. Angelica's mom actually died of a heroin overdose in 1982, just after Angelica was born. And Drew in his depression married a gold-digging whore that... <laughs> Angelica idolized because she fooled herself into thinking it was her real mom, and that's why she took the Barbie doll and made it after her mom's image, wearing an unwashed orange dress and having jacked up hair, which is why she was so attracted to it. Later in life, she followed in her mom's footsteps with drugs and everything, dying of an overdose at 13 when All Grown Ups was canceled. Jesus fucking Christ. Holy shit, okay. Um, I mean, to be completely honest, this theory is kind of reaching. I can see how you can make some depictions of how it's real or not, but... It just, I don't know. I'll, you guys can decide if you think this is real or not. Zoe 101 Actress Pregnancy yeah, so there's a, there's no theory or anything. The girl from Zoe 101 got pregnant and people believe that's the reason the show ended. There's been some interviews where she discusses how that wasn't the reason. Shit's wild. If you want to look more into it, go ahead. I, it's, it's pretty basic. Again, kind of surprised how it's not at the top of the iceberg. Random Cartoons. Random Cartoons is an American animation showcase television series. Much like Oh Yeah, Random Cartoons was first created by Fred Siebert and produced by Fred Raider Incorporated and Nickelodeon Animation Studio for Nicktoons. Creator Fred Siebert ordered 13 full-length episodes, 39 seven-minute shorts for the series, which was originally announced in 2005 as season four of Oh Yeah Cartoons. Production on the series started in 2005 and ended in 2006-2007, originally slated for a 2006-2007 release on Nickelodeon. It was later halted for release in 2008 on the separate Nicktoons network channel. Two of the shorts were selected to become television series and one of the shorts was selected to become a web series. Those shorts were Adventure Time, The Bravest Warriors, and Fanboy. Adventure Time began airing as a full-length series on April 5th, 2010 on Cartoon Network. The Bravest Warriors, under the new name Bravest Warriors, began airing on November 8th, 2012 on Cartoon Hangover. Fanboy, under the new name Fanboy and Chum Chum, began airing as a full-length series on November 7th, 2009 on Nickelodeon. This is interesting because I kind of grew up with all these shows. Also a huge Bravest Warrior fan. Cat Buck for life. Gas-powered stick, everybody. Gibby TV Show. Gibby was supposed to be a TV show show on Nickelodeon starring Noah Monk as Gibby Gibson. The series wasn't picked up. Gibby gets a gig at a recreational center where he winds up as a mentor to four offbeat middle school students. If it was picked up, it would have been produced by Dan Schneider and would have been a spinoff to the show iCarly. Well, I mean, now we have Sad World, which is Noah's YouTube channel, so it's all good. He's fucking bald, by the way. Just giving you a heads up. All right, folks, that's the second layer of the iceberg. We finished this one. Now let's move on to the third. Sponge Boy Ahoy. Exactly a year after Rocco's modern life had ended, Stephen Hillenberg and several crew 
members of Rocco's Modern Life began working on the pilot for SpongeBob SquarePants. The original name for SpongeBob was SpongeBoy and the show was meant to be called SpongeBoy Ahoy. The idea was ultimately scrapped and replaced with SpongeBob SquarePants due to a cleaning product of the same name existing. So to avoid copyright infringement, it was reworked. It was speculated that there was a different version of Help Wanted with a different intro sequence, where SpongeBob was known as SpongeBoy. The pilot was made on November 16th, 1997. But on 2009, the original opening sequence was uploaded on RetroJunk. Also, there's this rare screenshot that was very hard to come by, which has the original SpongeBob auditioning for a place at the Krusty Krab. Besides that, nothing else was really found from the original pilot. Although, sadly, on November 24th, 2015, the pilot was found, but the name was already switched to SpongeBob, and that pilot was uploaded on Vimeo. Family, Odd Parents, and Disney Channel. Disney XD is a television channel that's owned by Disney, and the first five seasons of the Fairly Odd Parents currently air on Disney XD in Latin America, and formerly in the Czech Republic. There's tons of like politics stuff that comes to like the owning of rights, having to deal with foreign issues with how you know Disney and ABC were branding at the time. But yeah, I think that's just kind of a little interesting fact. It's it's really not that deep. It's kind of just there, but. Yeah, it was cool to learn about that. Cartoon Network invades Nickelodeon. So, for Cartoon Network invading Nick, what I found was that the Cartoon Network had a commercial sneak onto Nickelodeon's air via unmonitored local ad buys. I mean, that's pretty funny. Like, an ad for Nickelodeon was playing on Cartoon Network. That's pretty funny. SpongeBob and Turan. So, there was a full Persian bootleg SpongeBob movie called SpongeBob and Turan. On YouTube, it was striked down, but you could probably find it somewhere else on the internet. It's a blank for blank ripoff of the original SpongeBob movie. Once again, nothing really too deep with that. It's it's just SpongeBob and Turan. This layer of the iceberg has kind of just been fun facts, so I'll move on. Arnold's parents. All we really knew about Arnold's parents, Miles and Stella, was that they disappeared on a humanitarian mission to San Lorenzo, where they were trying to cure people of the sleeping sickness. Let's keep it real, everybody knew those fuckers croaked at the time, don't bullshit it, you thought too. But in the newly released Hey Arnold movie, which aired in 2017, it finally reveals the answer to the mystery. The movie has the crew embark on a field trip through the fictional jungles of San Lorenzo. Arnold's parents were a victim of a type of sickness that caused them and all the adults to fall asleep. Luckily, a cure is found and Arnold gets to return home to his parents. That's nice. Wish I had that happy ending. I just hope dad brings back almond milk. Cosmo and Wanda are a metaphor for antidepressants. So this is referring to a Reddit post made seven years ago and I'll read it out for you. I recall in what was either a movie or a long episode, it was stated that the fairy godparents were only going to be around when Timmy needed them. For whatever reason, Timmy uses a handheld aging machine to see if the two would still be with him in his 20s. Turned out that they would be sticking with him for a long time. In the pilot episode, Cosmo and Wanda appear to Timmy on the night that Vicky comes into his life, basically saying that they start when the problems do. The problems are still there, but it makes them easier to handle. Cosmo is Zoloft, Wanda is Prozac. To be honest, this is a complete reach. Don't get me wrong, Butch is a guy who found the cure to cancer, but this theory has so many flaws that it just seems unlikely. Non-stop SpongeBob transmission. I tried to find things about the SpongeBob transmission and got nothing. I don't know if it might be referring to like island stuff, like Lost, with somebody just fucking singing every SpongeBob song while I played through a ham radio. BLM support transmission. This is referring to when Nickelodeon went off air for eight minutes and 46 seconds in support of justice, quality, and human rights. I didn't know this because who the hell watches cable, but yeah, that's that. All right, so this iceberg kind of was just fun facts. This was probably the most tame so far with just quick little information. But now we're going to be moving on to the fourth layer of the iceberg, and this is where I assume some weird ass shit starts coming up. The untitled Ren and Stimpy SpongeBob short was a canceled project by John Chris Volsey that was originally meant to be released as part of the third SpongeBob SquarePants movie, titled Sponge on the Run. SpongeBob made an announcement on TV that coming to theaters this Christmas, he'll be starring the next Sponge Out of Water movie. The short involves Sen and Stimpy having a great time watching SpongeBob SquarePants on TV, which angers Ren, who believes cartoons such as The Stimpsons are more intelligent. SpongeBob then makes an announcement that coming to theaters this Christmas, he'll be starring the next Sponge Out of Water movie. That's pretty interesting. I'll move on to the next one. Loud House and Peanut Connect. The Loud House is an animated series on Nickelodeon created by Chris Savino that premiered on May 2nd, 2016. Set in the fictional city of Royal Woods, Michigan, the series focuses on an 11-year-old middle child who copes with his day-to-day -day life alongside his 10 sisters. The reason for the belief to the connection is due to a lot of references being made about the Peanuts. Rugrats Storyboard Jam Storyboard Jam is a storyboard that is started, passed around, and added to by different members of the production crew of a cartoon, often resulting in rather lewd or offensive depictions. Production crews are said to often use storyboard jams to relieve anger and while working on a project. On such storyboard jam, it was titled Incredible and began life around 1998 within the Class B Cuspo production crew of Rugrats. 
Russell has recounted that the first page of the storyboard consisted of Angelica being a bitch to Tommy, so Tommy gets her a drink in the kitchen and puts dog food in it, then toddles back to Angelica. After being handed the comic, Russell initially pushed it away in disgust before eventually making some additions of his own. The first page added by Russell depicts Stu arriving home before aggressively abusing everybody and making sexual remarks to Angelica, while Tommy twitches uncontrollably. Allegedly, some of the artists were displeased with Russell's additions to the plot, though regardless of their disapproval, he continued the storyboard, beginning with the next page with a close-up of Stu's crotch, and then cut away showing his entire pelvis, in fact, two tight and well-rounded testicles with a tiny cock dangling from above. <sighs> Fucking Christ. Lighting was bouncing around and words appeared saying balls of thunder or something to that effect. In total, Russell ended up adding 12 frames to the storyboard, where most of the other artists had previously contributed three or four. After this point, the comic was given to the artist to add on, and this later resulted to images of Angelica's hands stroking Stu's testicles, followed by a barrage of incest sex scenes. Russell has noted, I was disgusted, even when I saw what had become of the comic. While someone was taking the storyboard to show the production crew of the Wild Thornberries, an executive producer producer saw it and was disturbed and confiscated the jam, and thus it ended. It's unknown if the missing pages were destroyed or simply locked away, but either way it's unlikely we will ever see more pages of this infamous comic. Well finally, I guess something a little bit more interesting than just like, uh, fun facts. Fucking Christ though. Holy shit. Cat Dog. Saving Mean Bob. Cat Dog Saving Mean Bob was a cancelled video game of the popular Nicktoon show Cat Dog for the original PlayStation. Not much is known about it other than the fact that Robert Lamorax worked on the game while working on a PC game Cat Dog Quest for the Golden Hydrant. It was also going to be originally published by Hasbro Interactive, who also published Quest for the Golden Hydrant. Only a few screenshots exist, as well as an advertisement published in the Nickelodeon magazine. The Club MMO The Club is an online multiplayer game created by Nickelodeon. The game was designed for children ages 6 to 14 since that was Nickelodeon's main demographic. In the club, the game allows players to create their own avatar, decorate their home with merchandise and furniture, as well as visit locations similar to actual Nickelodeon shows, such as iCarly. They can also watch videos and post comments on the message board. The game began development in November 2004 and released an open beta in June 2006. Five months later, the beta was closed and it was confirmed by Nickelodeon that over 3 million users tested the game. On January 30th, 2007, the full game was finally released to the public, under the new name Nicktropolis. We covered this early on the iceberg, and Nicktropolis ended up turning to be successful. On May 19, 2010, the game was redesigned to have 2D graphics and was renamed The Club. Not only the name was changed, but the site was also updated. In September 14th, Nickelodeon updated its website to have a more modern look, and because of this, the club had to be shut down. There's a few screenshots of the game, but it remains completely and utterly lost. I think this being on the iceberg's not really that interesting. I mean, it talks more about it, but since we covered Nicktropolis earlier, this is kind of repetitive. But I don't know, I guess it's still interesting to talk about the club and how it was shut down. Looney Tunes on Nickelodeon Nickelodeon aired all unaired cartoons in a show called Looney Tunes on Nickelodeon between 1988 and 1999. To date, Looney Tunes on Nickelodeon is the longest airing animated series on the network that wasn't a Nicktoon. Blue's Clues Korean Version There are apparently two Korean versions of the show, one under the tile Blue Puzzle, which aired on KBS2, and another under the name Blue's Clues in Korean, which aired on Nickelodeon. Not much is known about the KBS2 version, for only a brief clip was seen during the 2006 special Behind the Clues 10 Years of Blue. One one thing that is known is that Steve is replaced by a character named Hyun Soup Shin, which the same thing was done in the UK English dub where Steve is replaced by Kevin. So far, there are only two clips of it online. Blue's Clues can still be seen on the Korean Nickelodeon website, but the Nickelodeon Korean dub is just a dub of the American English dub. Cry Babe Lane Cry Baby Lane is a movie which premiered on Nickelodeon on October 28, 2000. It was then disowned by the network after complaints by parents over its scare factor. It was not to return until Halloween of 2011, when the movie aired as part of Stick or Treat on Teen Nick. Teen Nick would run this movie again on March 31st and October 31st of 2015. Skin Theory So the skin theory is based off of this YouTube video which discusses how there may be skin suits in Spongebob. It's kind of hard to talk about it here, but I'll just link the YouTube video down below and you can go watch it for yourself. It's kind of interesting, but it's like an hour long and to explain it fully it would just be discredit to that video, so just go watch it. Alright, now we're on the fifth layer of the iceberg. We're dwindling down, so stick around. The Butcher the Butcher was a reported puppet live-action short film from the early 2000s, featuring puppets made out of actual animal bones. It was brought to semi-popular attention through a post in r slash tip of my tongue subreddit. After describing the film, the National Film Board of Canada, who was partnered with Viacom at the time, began searching for archives of the production code of The Butcher, but found no evidence of the film's existence. Since there is very little evidence of the film, beyond Dead User 00 and a few other recounts, many speculate the film just to be a completely made-up hoax, or false memory, or even just simple confusion 
confusion with another movie or show. The Butcher, as they believed it was named, was a short film that aired sometime on Nickelodeon between 2001 and 2004. It was reportedly much darker than any of the other short films at the time, such as Strange Invaders. The intro showed the title card with a black background, and the film itself was entirely in black and white. The detail that caught the most attention, though, however, was the puppet used in the film, which was appeared to actually be made out of just completely animal bones, such as cat, dogs, birds, and rabbits. There's also a pair of human hands holding a butcher's knife, who would chop up the animal puppets. Additionally, there were scenes that were reported of animals inside glass containers, and one scene in particular where the animals are fused together to create an abomination. The film also contained no dialogue, only ambient music and sound effects. It's assumed that the movie might be actually Butcher's Hook by Sam and Pummel. Also, Dead User 00 is unsure if the film was aired on Nickelodeon. Aside from now the details, my opinions on it. Um, this seems kind of too dark to be on Nickelodeon. I don't think it's a full hoax, but he might have just saw something else and kind of got confused. I mean, to have animals fused together isn't too weird. You have cat dog, but that's cartoon. I mean, dead animal bones holding a butcher's knife kind of just seems way too far of a reach. Very Aggressive Vegetables. Very Aggressive Vegetables is a series of 30 second animated shorts produced by Fudge Puppy that aired on Nickelodeon UK in 1998. As the title implies, it depicted very aggressive vegetables taking revenge on the unsuspecting kids that insulted them. At least six shorts were produced, although only two of them have surfaced. In addition to the full version, at least four other shorts remain at large. Baby Corn, Zucchini, Zucchini, celery, and broccoli. Although the six known shorts have been uploaded to nick.com, a glitch in the video player presents the shorts from being played. Bobby the Lizard Boy. Bobby the Lizard Boy is a 2000 short, created by Nickelodeon by Sean Backenreimers. This short also aired in 2003 on Nicktoons Network. Before April 1st, 2015, only two pictures and one clip of the short have resurfaced. Also, before the 2015 discovery of the entire short, a contributor found a link that leads to the short on nick.com. The short's description was added to the site in 2002, along with the option to watch the short. However, the short can no longer be be viewed, and no version of the short has been recovered to date. On April 1st, 2015, a contributor to Lost Media Wiki discovered the entire Nicktoons Network version of the short, located an unlisted YouTube video from November 25th, 2013. And now you can watch the short today. Kurt Cobain's theme song for Ren and Stimpy. In 1991, before Kurt Cobain hit it big with his band Nirvana, he was a struggling, starving musician. One of his stabs at fame was going to be doing a song for Ren and Stimpy. It's been said that Kurt Cobain resorted the song for cheap, but felt proud of it. According to Ren and Stimpy voice actor Billy West, studio executives at Spumco Studios heard the song and thought it was fucking awful and threw it out. Shortly after this, Nirvana became famous with their second album, Nevermind, making Spumco and Nickelodeon executives consider the decision to be a mistake. Only Billy West has ever talked about this story, but nobody else at Spumco or Nickelodeon, nor anybody in the Cobain estate have confirmed nor denied the story, making it a complete mystery to whether it actually happened or not. However, it's been proven in the Nirvana book, Come As You Are, that Cobain indeed was a Ren and Stimpy fan. The book includes a photo taken at New Year's Day 1993 of Cobain with his plush Ren, with the caption reading, Kurt with close, personal friend, Ren Hoke. If this story is true and Kurt Cobain really did record a song for Ren and Stimpy, while some copies of it may still exist, the song has never been released as far to the general public. The alleged version was trashed, so none of the executives at Spumcore nor Nickelodeon still have a copy. Still, Cobain's estate is yet to comment on the matter at all. Many Ren and Stimpy fans who are also Nirvana fans are saddened by the fact that Cobain was rejected by Spumco, but remain hopeful that one day an occurrence will happen and the song will someday be heard. In 2015, the soundtrack to the documentary film about Cobain's life called Montage of Heck was released. It was entirely made up of home recordings that Kurt Cobain made. I mean, on Ren and Stimpy's part, fucking sucks to suck. I mean, that's what you get for not taking a chance on the little guy. I mean, this shit happens all the fucking time. People get afraid to take chances on stuff. I mean, once again, just suck to fucking suck. Kablam episode 29. Episode 29 is an urban legend of Kablam, where viewers thought the episode revealed Henry and June's love for each other. This episode was a subject of controversy. In the plot, Henry and June give out awards for the shorts seen on Kablam, and bid farewell to their viewers since 1996. When the show debuted on Nickelodeon, in the end of said plot, Henry and June finally close the pages to a big comic book and end the series with a kiss. The kiss is received by Henry and given by June as they say goodbye. However, in 2011 on a Kablam fan site that's now been shut down since then, Henry and June's segment creator Mark Merrick confirmed that the episode was fake and Henry and June's relationship is 100% platonic. The actual 29th episode is on the website and is now available for download. According to Merrick, Henry and June didn't like each other like that. The real final episode would later be episode 48, Just Chillin'. I don't know anything about this show, and I don't really know anything about these episodes, but it's kind of funny to see like a hidden thing with one episode. Don't even know what the fuck Kablam was, this is interesting. Splat. I tried to find more about Splat and found something that states that he's the leader of a good guy army. I don't fucking know, I barely even know what the hell this is talking about. If you know anything else about Splat referring to this iceberg, then tell me down below, because I'm just confused and I tried to research more about it, but just couldn't find anything. 
so I'll just move on. The Backyard Against Pilot. Me and My Friends is a live action pilot that inspired the Backyard Against. It was filmed at Nickelodeon Studios, Florida in September 1998. This is actually just a nice little thing. I didn't know Backyard Against had a pilot and it's kind of funny just watching it because it's just to see how much it's grown. Like this has nothing deep to it. It was just the pilot that ended up getting picked up. It's kind of wholesome actually. So this ends the fifth layer of the iceberg. We only have two more left, so let's see how this goes. Real life cat dog. All right, this story is actually kind of fucking cool. Veterinarians in Florida created a genuine cat dog when they gave a dying kitten a life-saving transfusion using dog blood. This is a type of blood transfusion that involves a cat receiving dog blood in order to continue producing new red blood cells. So they just made this little guy. It's pretty fucking cute actually. Like I was expecting some Frankenstein monster, but this is awesome. I mean, it's a win-win and then it's an actual cat dog. I don't know why this is so down on the iceberg. Well, I guess to be fair, nobody knows about it, but usually when you go this down on iceberg, you expect some cryptic ass shit, but this is just awesome. I know it's still going to be completely downhill from here, but at least we get to start this off with this. Ren and Stimpy Life Sucks. Life Sucks is a scrapped episode of Ren and Stimpy, conceived around the time when John Chris Falsey was fired from Nickelodeon in 1992. It was going to be in the old series, but was pushed to adult party cartoon a decade later. At least a third of it was recorded and storyboarded, but didn't succeed to finish production on time. The episode begins with Stimply happily watering his garden when Ren comes and tells him that life sucks. Stimpy disagrees with him, so Ren tells him the story of the Children's Crusade, in which thousands of children went marching the Holy Lands in order to reclaim it, but ended up dead from the elements, or were sold into slavery once they arrived. Despite the story, Stimpy still remained optimistic. Okay, this makes sense. I mean, it's a children's cartoon talking about Holy Crusades and slavery and stuff. I mean, when you look at the time when it comes to cartoons, cartoons were just used for escapism. So it makes sense that you wouldn't want this on a child's television thing. But yeah, all that really happened was that the storyboards were made, but it just never finished. I still wonder how this was even found though. Like who even knew about this to put it on the iceberg? Doug is schizophrenic. Doug aired on Nickelodeon from 1991 to 1994, and then was later acquired by Disney, where it was renamed as Brand Spaking New. Doug would get so caught up in his imagination that he acted out what he was seeing in his mind, which led some people to theorize that Doug was a schizophrenic. That's pretty much it. This is once again reaching. This is just like the Rugrats theory, where like you could put two and two together, but it's a fucking TV show. I don't think it was implied for him to be like a schizophrenic. I mean, you can make the parallels, of course, but I don't know. I just think this is reaching. Plankton got served. So this is a creepy pasta, and I'll read it for you. I am sure many have heard of the last episode Creepypastas. They are usually an incredibly graphic episode that conveys such fear for children and it was never aired, though someone managed to sneak a viewing or owns one of the tapes. The most popular example of this is Squidward's Suicide, in which Squidward commits suicide, hence the title. Of course, all these Creepypastas are false, yet I remember a Spongebob episode that was altered heavily but still remains in circulation today. This is one course meal from season seven. In this episode, Mr. Crab finds out that Plankton is horrified of whales. This is one of the least popular episodes of the show due to how dark the nature of the episode is, even after the episode was heavily altered. Now, how would I have seen this episode before it was edited? This is one of the seven SpongeBob episodes that was revealed on the internet before it was aired on TV. I was always a big fan of the show and I was excited of the idea of having a SpongeBob episode premiere on the internet before television. I rapidly reloaded the Nick page and finally the episode came up. It was known as Plankton got served, though it was eventually changed. Most of the episode is identical to the one that is circulated today. Plankton manages to break into the Krusty Krab and ties up Mr. Krabs and Spongebob. As he's about to finally get the secret formula from Spongebob, Mr. Krabs' daughter, Pearl, walks in. This terrifies Plankton and causes him to run out. Plankton later claims his ancestors were eaten by whales and that's why he fears them so much. Mr. Krabs realizes fear that Plankton has and decides to use it against him. He dresses up as his daughter and begins to follow Plankton around, frightening him. Plankton decides he can no longer take and decides to do the ultimate decision. Plankton decides to commit suicide. Yes, this is still in the show today. You're free to watch it. Plankton waits for the bus as he lies in the street, waiting to get run over. That is when SpongeBob comes over and tries to convince him to continue his existence. This is where the alteration of the two versions begin. Plankton fails to heed SpongeBob's words and remains there. In another altered version, SpongeBob says the same things, but Plankton refuses to believe him. SpongeBob decides that the only thing he could do to show him the truth is to drag Mr. Krabs outside. As soon as he leaves after, the red bus comes along and Plankton sits up and watches it hit him as everything fades to darkness. Plankton finds himself standing on a single platform, overlooking darkness, in the darkness. He sees whales, all looking up at him. There are members of his family he could faintly make out, calling for him to jump down. Plankton looks above and sees a light, a light he could scarcely believe. This would seem to represent heaven and hell. Plankton, redesigned to his fate, jumps and plunges down into the darkness. This is when the episode ends, and the traditional credits are shown. Alright, this is complete cap of course. I mean, it's a creepypasta. This is way too fucking graphic once again. Now leaving Bikini Bottom. 
Now leaving Bikini Bottom is the pilot episode of Room of Four. Squidward, Mrs. Puff, Plankton, and Karen one day decide to leave Bikini Bottom and live together. After packing and saying their goodbyes, they head for the bus station and head to St. Louvar. After arriving, the four purchase a room in the Green Algae Home apartment. Regarding this, a post is made. That's pretty much it. I mean, this was a pilot episode that never really came out. As we go down in this iceberg, there's more things that can't really be proved, and this is kind of just there. Still don't know why this is so low down. It's a pilot for an episode that eventually came out about them living together. Nickelodeon movie that used real bones. This is just a Reddit post that's talking about the butcher. The butcher was covered earlier in this iceberg. It's a whole thread that goes talking about how he thought he saw a movie called The Butcher and how he used real bones. We talked about it earlier. I don't want to bash this iceberg because there's, of course, interesting stuff in here, but this is just repetitive. I think this happened the same thing earlier with Nicktropolis. Nickelodeon movies that use real bones and the butcher are just the same fucking thing, so I'm just not going to explain too much. Well, that's it. Now we just have one more layer of the iceberg, then we're finished. People of color are the elite ruling class in Doug. I haven't seen the show that much, but going off assumptions, this might be a huge reach. Don't get me wrong, Doug does have a lot of people of color, but from what I've watched, I don't really feel the power dynamic that much. I don't know, I think this is one of those things where you connect the dots by anything, such as a bunch of the other theories on these icebergs that are completely cap. I don't want to discredit kids' cartoons are stupid, because they're not. There's very much good adult themes and stuff, such as like Over the Garden Wall and Cartoon Network and stuff and Gravity Falls, but this just seems kind of cap. I don't know how else to put it, I just don't believe it. Nickelodeon 1914 The Nickelodeon was the first type of indoor exposition space dedicated to showing projected motion pictures in the United States. Usually set up in covered storefronts, these small, simple theaters charged five cents for admission and flourished from about 1905 to 1914. I think the actual real time is 1905 to 1915, but you get the point. And this is pretty cool. It's like one of those old like film thingies where you have to put your eye in it. I'm guessing most people don't fully know about them, but yeah, that's interesting. Nickelodeon Japan. Nickelodeon Japan is a television channel which targets children, teens, and adults. Started on November 1998 as as a cable and satellite television channel. Viacom attempted to bring Nickelodeon brand to the Japanese market. However, due to the declining viewership, the channel was taken off air on September 30th, 2009. After the channel's closure, some programs were moved to other specific channels, including MTV Japan, DTH satellite channels, and terrestrial television networks. New programs made their national television premieres on other channels. For example, The Penguins of Madagascar made a debut on NHK Educational Television on April 4th, 2010. Let's go! Love those penguins. The official website is still online with program information, website games and downloadable stuff. Nickelodeon Japan returned on January 30th, 2018, and it was announced in October 2017. Nickelodeon Japan is currently available and is exclusive to two subscription-based TV streaming channels, like DTV Channel and Hulu Japan. Nickelodeon's programs were then broadcast on Animax in Japan under the television block titled Nick Time, starting with SpongeBob SquarePants from September 1st, 2010, as of 2018. Also, other Nickelodeon shows have been aired from the Japanese feeds of Disney Channel and Disney XD, meaning that there's Nickelodeon shows on Disney Channel once again. Still questioning why this is so low in the iceberg, but it's still an interesting little, like, fact. Nickelodeon 2007 Web Incident This is referring to a post made on Reddit, and I'll read it for you now. When I was about 16, I came home from hanging with friends. I was a huge cartoon fan. Still am. Grabbed some food and settled into my bed to watch Nickelodeon. I knew it was Nick because it was the last channel I watched that day, and no one shared the TV in my room. So I turned it on to see this creepy black, white, and gray scene where hundreds of humans are walking in a line over these hills in the background towards these giant hamster wheels in front of the scene. They're walking toward the wheels as people are already in the wheels, walking endlessly, and mindlessly in the robotic, zombie-like state. The people walking toward the wheels are also in this similar state, as if there's no life within their eyes. They're just cold and robotic. There's this wind-like noise whistling in the background. It looks real, not animated. And as I watch in awe at this dark scene, I come to a similar conclusion and ask myself why Nick would have something so live and non-action. As the entire scene keeps repeating itself of more humans walking toward and in these hamster wheels, I start thinking maybe just some sort of weird short, and it's kind of cool in a dark sort of way. But minutes go by, and it starts to get dual, watching the same thing, not doing anything else. So I quickly changed the channel to something else, and when in a split second I realized, wait a minute, what the fuck did I just watch? And change it back immediately only to find Spongebob on mid-episode. You could tell Spongebob was on for a while. Not like the weird shorts played first and they came on or anything. Freaked out, I kept going back surrounding channels thinking maybe it wasn't actually on Nick. But nothing had the hamster wheel video on. I've tried to research what this was for years and could never be able to find anything remotely similar. Not sure if it was some sort of broadcast interference or something out of this world, but if anyone has any information or logical explanation, I would greatly appreciate it. I think you could relate this back to Clockman. She's trying to find this broadcast, but some people are just disregarding it as a creepypasta. And to be completely honest, I don't know. There's a lot of air hijacking, so this could have been real, but there was nothing found on it. I don't know though. It's definitely an interesting story, and if it is real, I hope one day evidence gets found of it. Now for the last entry. Dan Schneider Foot Fetish. 
Yeah, he's kind of a fucking freak. He was quietly let go from Nickelodeon, but that's it. He was being heavily exposed by the general public during the height of the Me Too movement. Obviously, there's a lot of pictures of him being a little bit too friendly with the actresses, his obsession with putting said actresses feet into shows, and him asking for young girls to send pictures of their feet as promotion for the show on the Twitter. There's also rumors of him fathering Jamie Lynn Spears' child, but it's not confirmed. Dude's a fucking freak and an actual loser. This motherfucker definitely had to visit Epstein's Island. I mean, yes, there's so much evidence compiled on Dan Schneider to prove that he's a fucking freak freak and when you rewatch these shows it's just not the same anymore like if you watch victorious right now there's so many overly sexual like things going on that just you can't watch the show with good faith anymore same thing with iCarly and stuff when it came to dan schneider the clear deliberateness is just fucking kind of disturbing and if you just go more and more into this like rabbit hole you find more fucking freak ass shit about him like look at some of these scenes i'm playing for you now like how the hell do you watch this and assume good faith what i recommend you do though in forms of dan schneider is you go look up more information there's so many videos is exposing him and so many th more tidbits about him but yeah i mean the foot fetish is clearly fucking true so that's it we're at the end of the iceberg we covered a lot of things in a lot of time i know there might have been things i got wrong or things i didn't cover clearly so if this video does well enough i might do another video where i kind of fix some of those mistakes but overall i really enjoyed doing this like a lot it was really fun to find weird facts about nickelodeon and talk about it completely once again, gotta thank the person who made this. And if you're still watching this video and you chose to click on it and don't know who I am, I appreciate you watching this too. If you enjoyed this video, the best way you could support me is by simply subscribing. Of course, liking the video and commenting helps too, you know, let's not bullshit it, but a subscription would be pretty nice. Also, if you like moi at all, I recommend you check out some of my other videos. Also, if you make content yourself and want to share it to other people, you should join my Discord below. You could promote, make new friends, and just chill. Once again, thank you for making it to the end of the video. And yeah, that was May Skipper. I'll see ya.